Mm. And it's pretty. Shall we do it? Oh, we're starting? Yeah. Alright guys, we might just make a start. Thank you all so much for coming out here today to see Jen George. Um, as many of you <laughs> as many of you may know, um, she has an incredible uh, startup and she's been credited with having possibly one of the most innovative startups in Australia right now. Um, no worries. Um, and her company is valued now at over $20 million. So today we're just going to start by having a presentation of say a couple words. Everyone from eGroup was kind enough to fly Jen over here from Sydney. And then we're going to get Jen to say a couple words. And then we're hopefully going to have a good Q&A session where you guys can figure out how she made all her dollars. So <laughs> I'll hand it over to Evan. Awesome. Thank you. So I just wanted to say hello, um, basically, and just let you guys know a little bit about eGroup, um, really briefly. So uh, eGroup's been going for about six years. Um, we're not a co-working space, but we are very much involved in tech and startup and that sort of thing. So basically our big remit and what I'm doing is, uh, with the committee as well, not just me, I'd like to take all the credit for it, but I won't, um, is we're finding awesome people like Jen and bringing them over to Perth. So um, we have, yeah. Kidnapping, right. Um, so, you know, we have had a lot of really fantastic speakers from the local ecosystem as well, but I really want to add unique value. So, um, I encourage you to come down and check it out if you can. Uh, it's first Tuesday of every month at Rays in West Perth. Um, we have a membership fee as well. It's not a huge amount considering that you get free food and drinks um, at every event and it's pretty well catered. So, it's a hundred bucks for the year, but there's always really fantastic, awesome speakers. So I know, you know, students, you guys are often a little bit tight with cash, but just think about it as cheap food, basically. A really cheap evening um, with fantastic stuff on the side. So I just wanted to say hello, and um, thanks for having me, but more importantly, thanks for having Jen, and uh, I'll hand over now. Thank you. Um, hi guys, my name is Jen, I'm 24, and started one shift three years ago in June 2012, June 13th to be specific. Um, as this is a small group, please, uh, I want to keep this really casual, so at any point if you want to ask a question or heckle, whatever works, then please do it. Um, but basically, to give you a bit of an idea of what OneShift is, um, it's a talent marketplace that connects candidates and businesses. So think dating website, you say what you need, you, or you say you Google blue car, you get blue cars, right? Same thing, I need a bartender, I need it in this postcode, I want them to have tattoos, I want them to have access to a vehicle, you get access to those people. Um, so we've been going, as I said, for about three years. We've got over half a million users and about 36,000 businesses using us across the country. So anything from mum and dad looking for a nanny on Friday night to larger corporates looking for about 4,000 people a month. So um, I guess where we started was a very 21-year-old view on life. Um, work behind the bar Friday night so that you can go out Saturday night. Um, hence the name One Shift. Uh, but since then, we've actually evolved quite a bit to now casual part-time as well as full-time work. Uh, in January, February, we actually get most of our full-time roles posted because everyone's looking for a diet, new gym and obviously a new job. So it's really dynamic into what people are looking for. Uh, but we've, we've built this basically because we are for the candidates. Um, we want to make sure that people can change the way that they choose to work, whether it's one hour a week or a hundred hours a week. Um, rather than I guess the seek model or the job board model where it's you apply for 30 jobs and good luck if you actually get a response from anyone, if that makes sense. Um, so our team, we have couple of grey hairs in there. My dad's our chairman, which is always an interesting debate, as one might call it, but I can say we've never actually had a fight. Um, we've got all your usual culprits, so a CFO, CMO, CMO is marketing, CTO is um, chief technical officer, all those sorts of things. Um, and then, So we've got about uh, 40 something in the group now, we're getting up to about 50 over the next sort of month um, with new starters. Anything from developers to marketing, um, finance, admin, sales and account managers and things like that. So a lot of personalities in the office. <laughs> um, so what we're disrupting is basically we want to use technology and data um, to give the, uh, match people together as quickly as possible um, for really cheap. Because at the end of the day, technology is getting better and better. Um, people should be expecting a hell of a lot more for the money that they're spending online to get access to something. So for us, we, our best turnaround time is 27 minutes for a business to post a role um, in Lean Gatha, Victoria uh, for a barista. And within 27 minutes of that, they actually had somebody turn up into their shop to start working. So it's all about the accuracy of that data and presenting the best possible information to the business 
to connect with people as soon as possible and hopefully get them in ASAP to start work. So where we're positioned in the market, um, this is some fancy marketing slide that marketing do and then you're supposed to attempt to explain it. Um, but you've got Gumtree up in the corner, which is that free classifieds model. I'm sure you've all used Gumtree. You've got other startups like Spot Jobs in Melbourne, which is really mimicking that Seek sort of job board approach. Um, then you've got your usual sort of culprits, Career One and Seek. So we're sort of more towards the Gumtree model because we're cheap as chips, we're 30 bucks a job post. Um, but we're also a very analytically driven um, model. So we collect all sorts of information about our users and businesses. So when, for example, a say you looked at a job, we would look at your profile as well and benchmark you against everybody else in the industry and actually redirect you to more roles like that. So think iTunes, you watch a movie or Netflix and it shows you other movies you might be interested in. Same sort of thing, but jobs. Do you guys write? Do you want to grab some seats? There's heaps up here. <laughs> Let's make it really awkward for you. <laughs> So the vision for us is to change the way that people um, choose to work. So whether it is one hour a week or you're just working for that next holiday, uni holidays, or you know, 100 hours a week, it's completely up to you. But we want to put the candidates first in our marketplace. I mean, because we're, we're all candidates at some point in our life and we're sick of, I guess, the businesses always getting the, the attention and anything that they want goes and you don't actually hear back. So from a business point of view, think about um, when somebody posts a role on a job board or a classified, they get about 500 applications, let's say. Um, 499 of those candidates aren't going to get a job. So for us, that's the complete wrong way of doing things. For us, we want 10 people applying for that role, for them to be the perfect 10. And more than likely, that business is going to end up hiring a couple more rather than just one. Um, so I guess it's really flipping um, the recruitment process on its head that's currently out there in the market. So how does it work? So you create a role. So basically, you put in all your usual sort of culprits, so anything from a ooh, hey, job title, job description, all that sort of stuff. We, you can ask what languages people speak. So we find French restaurants, for example, we like all of them to speak French, or um, we find in retail. In Sydney, we find that people actually ask for Korean as a second language. So it really depends on the market, the role, and the areas that people are living in to a um, Melbourne coffee shop where they want a bearded, tattooed guy who smokes and looks like a hipster. Completely depends on the role. Um, so straight away, you see your results. So photo, work history, education history, personality type, all the information, and you can start scrolling through and see people that actually suit your requirement. This is based on all the information that the site has collected and the algorithms pulling in, basically on how people interact in the marketplace as well as the data and resume that they've uploaded. So from there, you can look into somebody's profile, and I'm sure you can imagine we've seen some interesting characters. Um, my favourite to date is Edward from Moffat Beach. Um, he's 40 years old, and his description was. When I was in high school, I was super fit, but his photo was a selfie naked in the bathroom with two mirrors. Yeah, let's say he hasn't been hot yet. <laughs> um, so hint, don't do that for a professional photo, just saying. Um, so from here, you can straight away contact the profile if you're interested. You can instant message them, so same as Facebook chat goes to the app. Um, you can give them a text, give them a phone call. So it's all about speed. How quickly can we connect the candidate and the business? And also, businesses are contacting candidates, so it's not always the candidate's job always applying for 20 roles and fingers crossed, right? See if you can get a job. So that's just the chat. I'm sure you've all seen a chat box before. It's not very exciting. So the journey of one ship, yes, somebody in my team has put up drunk photos, so apologies in advance. But um, so I went to high school at Kambala um, in Sydney. And from there, I, st I think my first uh, business was a babysitter's club, so I haven't really had any background in tech for starters, I can't code for the life of me, so don't ever ask. Um, and the other thing is I've never really run a proper business. Um, my first one was babysitter's club where I kept getting asked by other mothers to be at more houses than once, and obviously there's only one of me, so I can't be at many places at once. Um, so I'd get my friends to actually do it. And I'd charge the parents 20 bucks, finder's fee, and then take $5 an hour from my friends who were working, you know, for 10, 15 dollars an hour. <laughs> So of course I had no idea about taxes, minimum wages, all those sorts of things. Um, and then I was living at home, so I was 16 at the time, and my dad started taking all the envelopes. Because there's all these young girls turning up to the front door with cash-filled envelopes. Going, Mr. George, hi, how are you going? Can you give this to your daughter? So my dad's going, what the hell's going on? So cash flow, what's your money? Dad's stealing all the money. Um, and he randomly sits me down on the table with all these envelopes going, Joe, what the hell is going on? You know, drugs, prostitution, and I'm going, what's the piece of this club? I don't understand. Um, so shut that down pretty quickly. But that was my first, I guess, business experience in Berkeley <laughs> um, So from there, I finished high school and got a scholarship for Bond University. I am a sucky student. Um, so I did three semesters. You do three semesters a year then. 
plan rules into a double degree for property and law and just decide, figured out by the end of the semester that you can actually just go negotiate marks with your teachers rather than actually having to turn off the class. Um, so I was a horrible student. So I realised by the end of it this was not for me. Uh, so I came back to Sydney and actually worked at Night Frank uh, for six months and then I decided to go on a gap year. Um, there's the super yacht industry in South France, so just go, um, working holiday style, just go get over there, find a job and just see what happens. So um, I negotiated my way onto a boat basically in, um, on Thebes and basically what you do is you print off your resume old school style for about a euro fifty, bloody expensive for a piece of paper, and you basically had to hit the docks and negotiate with all the captains along the way about how much experience you've had and how amazing you are at serving coffee and whatnot, slash this is your first season but they don't need to know that. So learning to sell yourself very quickly on the spot while there's you know a couple hundred other people that are going to be hitting that dock that day. Um, so by chance, um, the captain uh, that I got a job on the boat for was like, "Come on, do you know? Do you like paella? Do you like rosé?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Great, come for lunch." He's like, "Perfect. <laughs> We're going to get along just fine." Um, so we sat down, had paella, had a glass of rosé, and I was like, "Right, so let's get to the interview." He's like, "No, no, no, it's fine. It's all good. You can have a job." And I was like, "Oh, sweet, thanks." Can I start tomorrow? Because I only had 20 euros to my name, so I was like, okay, if I can get on the boat, then at least I, don't, I won't run out of money because it's free accommodation. You're living on these, you know, 60 to 90 meter boats, um, and all your food's included. And of course, being Europe, food is wine and food, so I didn't have to spend anything. And then when the owners came on, they gave you tips, cash tips, so you weren't spending any money. You were just saving really quickly. Um, and he said, no, you, you've got to wait 30 days till the owners come on. I was like, oh, God. So I tried to negotiate and went, no, 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 if you want the job, it starts in 30 days. Uh, so from there, I went back to the hostel and there was about 30 other people in the exact same situation, trying to pay rent and obviously food. Um, we all went to the same coffee shop downstairs. So I went across the road and said, look, we're all here. We've got chefs who cook for, you know, people who are in 90 meter boats. I think they'll be, they'll be okay with that bacon and egg roll in the morning. So give us the chefs, let us pick and choose. I don't want to have anything to do with the pay wages this time. Um, I just want to be able to have that flexibility of choosing when I work and when I don't so I can survive for 30 days. Um, thankfully the manager said yes and then from there um, so made it onto the boat. And so after about um, a couple of weeks working on the boat, the owners finally came on and it just happened to be the royal family of Saudi Arabia. I was like, what the hell? Turns out they owned the five boats as well in the line because you know you wouldn't want to sit next to anyone on a boat, which is insane, but anyway. <laughs> Um, and we had, by the fifth day of them being on board, literally all we had to do was go to an espresso machine, push the button, bring it to them, and they'd be like, here's 500 euros. Yeah, monopoly money, right? That's crazy. And you're like, does anyone want another coffee? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> um, and on the fifth day, one of the um, uh, grandmothers was like, oh, can I have a massage? And I was like, I'm not a masseuse. Oh yeah, but just, yeah, masseuse, great, fantastic, you're a masseuse. I'm like, no, I'm not a masseuse. And I was like, damn it, okay. You know, you get your mother, you just kind of like push you like, there you go, mum, done, like walk away. Did that, she's like, fantastic, we've got a professional masseuse on board. I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> Next minute, I'm being um, <laughs> helicoptered between the boats for massages because I'm a professional masseuse. <laughs> like, that's about it. Um, and then they're like, hey, do you want to come travel with us? I was like, sweet, okay, see what happens. So went to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia with them, um, went to Paris for a couple of months, um, went to New York because the princess wanted to go shopping, like, it was insane. Let's just say Jetstar is no longer the same when you're a masseuse slash nanny who gets their own bedroom on a private jet. <laughs> I love my leg room now. Um, so from there, I kind of got bored of that sort of lifestyle because as a in that position, you had two people looking after you and the kids were taken care of by other people, but you were managing the kids in some regard. I don't know, it was very strange. Um, so I came back to Australia in November 2011. And from there, I read to, oh, Google, how do you start a business basically? Or, so, or how do I find developers? And I found this developer in Houston, Texas to try and set up a blog um, of the idea of matching skill sets to businesses as they needed them. So candidates could have the choice of when they work. So they could work behind the bar Friday night and go out Saturday night. Yes, I was still 21 at the time, so it was very 21 year old's view on life, just the weekend. Um, and then from there, I negotiated to get this site built for $5,000. And she said, fantastic, send me 2,500 up front and I'll do the work. And I was like, yeah, that seems fair enough. Sent her the $2,500 and never heard back from her. Great, let's see what happens. Um, so I literally copied and pasted the same email to her for two years going, give me my money back. And eventually said she sent it back, thank goodness, to get me to go away. But persistence is a good lesson. <laughs> um, but then from there I started a WordPress blog because I feel, felt like I didn't want to trust anyone to give them money to kind of do you know, the website. So I just did a thing called Sneaky Ships to sort of get it off the ground. Um, and I would literally, I started work, full-time work at a company called um, Colliers International. 
and I would literally print off posters after work and then go put them up at universities with the old duct tape and this is why I'm not allowed near marketing. Um, would you sign up to a site like that? <laughs> it was pretty dodgy. Anyway, so after doing that on the weekends, I would get an iPad and literally go harass coffee shops and bars to sign up to this matching algorithm website slash was me up till 3 a.m. in the morning physically just matching every single person to a job, um, showing that there were applications. Um, so faking it till you make it is definitely a big one, with a glass of wine, of course. Uh, so basically that was the way we got started, just literally hitting all the universities in our areas and then hitting every single coffee shop, pub that I possibly could on the weekends, just trying to get people to sign up. So it was a very agricultural approach, but we had a couple of hundred uni students using it and a couple of clubs, and that's when we knew this is an actual concept that could actually work. Um, so from there, I literally harassed everyone is probably the nicest version. I had my t-shirt, one shirt t-shirt on, and I would go to every single thing, try and get, you know, sports stars, TV presenters, all sorts, holding a one shirt card and taking a, a photo. And I would put it up on all our social media and really create that marketplace or perception of a marketplace as much as possible. Um, so I even would go stand outside Channel 7 studio in Pitt Street in Sydney, basically has the window, and there would be me and my t-shirt, like, hello, hello. And I, I just, for some reason, had in my head that if, so, if I got on TV, like a little logo in the background where no one can see, if somebody saw it, I'd have millions of people on my website. But only realized it was actually my mum who'd see me and that was about it. Um, so lesson learned on that one, don't get up at 5 a.m. for the window of the morning shows. Um, but from there, we actually got so, uh, contacted by the Channel 10 breakfast show because they could see all this stuff happening, lots of stars sort of getting involved in this perception of this marketplace. So in our first week of launching in 2012, we were on the breakfast show which was awesome just from doing that. So getting out there and creating a brand is really important, showing that there's a lot of people involved in it as well. Um, but from there, we put everything up on social media and really create that marketplace, which has been really important. But what we're finding now is your business page on Facebook doesn't actually generate any sort of ROI back into your actual business, driving traffic there. So think you pay for somebody to like your page, then you have to pay to reach those people again, and then you have to pay to reach them again, try and convert them onto your website. So trying to get people to direct to your website as much as possible was really important. And we found that like uh, for our own business model, finding aggregators and you know through at Google AdWords and things like that, that actually gets us better traction. Um, so thinking about in your own business, where's the closest point of conversion for your customers is probably the biggest lesson we've learned so that you don't have to double or triple pay just to try and get them along that pipeline a lot quicker for yourselves. So our culture in our office, we've got a lot of personalities. <laughs> Um, so we've got anything from sales to marketing to development, um, UX designers, finance, admin, all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's all about making sure we have the right culture in the team. So a lesson we've learned is that getting in the values really quickly is really important. We only did it in January this year, but the impact that that has had on the business has been really important. So enabling anyone in the team to really pull people up and go, well, hang on, what, what our values actually make it happen. So don't wait till tomorrow to do it, do it today. Um, so some of our values, or the four we have, is make it happen. So get it done today, don't wait till tomorrow, or whatever the case, because we are a startup. Every day counts. Well, we're not doing it. We've got a competitor down the road who's probably trying to do it as well. Um, team first. Team first is an obvious one. It's um, family, because we spend way too much time together. Uh, but it's about having each other's backs. If you have each other's backs, it means that you can keep trying new things. People feel confident that if they go jump up a cliff to try something new, they've got their whole team behind them backing them. So the old customer is always right, isn't true in our office. We make sure that it's always back your um, teammate up and make sure that they have a good crack. And you know what, we've, in the long run, we've had some pretty big stuff up, so I can say that, but we've also, I think, come a lot further ahead because of it. Uh, so the no bullshit one is no politics. Transparency, if there's an issue, put it on the table and let's fix it, rather than, I don't know, sitting on it, holding a grudge for three months or letting something you know keep dragging on that's actually costing us money or time is the bigger picture. So. As long as people are honest, they can't actually get in trouble because how are we supposed to evolve as a business if we're not all being transparent with what's actually going on? Test fail alone is a huge one for us. We've tried pretty much everything at this point. <laughs> so we did a two week TV ad campaign in Newcastle and New South Wales, um, trying to get on businesses. We did a month's radio campaign back in 2012, trying to get businesses on board. We couldn't get the traction through it. We also tried pamphlet drops, we've tried um, God, running around the street in t-shirts doesn't work either. Um, so for us, it's been really trying to figure out what works for us. Um, we've even had developers actually change the payment price on the site from $30 to three cents, uh, yeah, three cents for two days. You can imagine the accounts team flipping out about that after we found out. Um, we've had 
gosh, people completely accidentally shut down the website. We've almost had our whole database wiped. We thought for 24 hours we'd lost everything. Um, but we're okay. So it's, it's always about testing lots of different things, seeing what works and seeing what, what you can learn from it and evolve as a business. So something we do internally is at the end of every month, so we've actually got it this Friday, is every department presents the last 30 days and the next 30 days for what they're focusing on. So everyone in this room would know where we're heading, what we're doing and what's going on. Um, which is important because if you're all heading in different directions, you're never going to get to the place you need to be. If you're all heading in the same direction at a force with lots of people, you're going to succeed. Um, we also do, um, what else do we do? We have social clubs and things like that, which is great. It's a good way to bond and step outside of work and get to know each other a bit better. Uh, we also do a, um, a side project. So we'll pull people from different teams um, and whether it's, we try and stay away from always grabbing the managers. It's the account manager who's dealing with Bob's garage on the corner kind of thing who gets the feedback, who can actually go, right, we're finding this isn't working, let's try and do something different. So at the moment we did Project X, um, in the first week of trial, that project actually outperformed our whole business. So it's always about how do we disrupt our own model? How do we do it better without obviously cutting ourselves off at the kneecaps? <laughs> Monster stuff. Um, so now we've actually launched that and within the first three days, we actually outperformed the, the whole week's trial and now we're scaling that business appropriately and started a whole new team. So BDMs have been pulled out um, from our existing business and now are running that business because they've actually come up with the idea and doing that full steam ahead. So being dynamic as a business is really important and making sure everybody has a voice no matter what position they're in, that they can change the face and direction of the business. Because let's be serious, we don't know everything. Nobody does. <laughs> so what we've achieved in this time, this is the crazy timeline that never really makes sense to me, but we have, uh, in 2013, we took on investment from Program, our investors. Um, they bought 27.5% of the company for $5 million. We're approached in the first week of July, oh sorry, first week of December 2012, um, when we were five months old. So we were on a current affair and the AFR, we had a whole page article on us there and they saw us and went, we want to be involved with this company. We had no payment gateway, we were free. Didn't even know how to get a payment gateway on, how to ask for credit cards. So we said, look, give us six months, let us figure it out and we'll come back to you. Um, in that time, we were really fortunate to have about seven other suitors, so to speak, come and approach us, anything from other online um, people in the job space, the media companies, etc. But it meant that we could pick and choose what suited us. So why we took programmed on was because even if we were given $100 million today, we'd still spend it on making our marketplace work. What is gonna make your business successful is the big question that a startup so you need to figure out. Um, and once you figure that out, it means that you can guarantee that success. So for us, businesses and candidates make our marketplace work. Getting a labor hire recruitment company with access to one and a half million candidates and you know, heaps of businesses <coughs> all around the country meant that we could put that straight into the marketplace and it would automatically start working. So even if we were given that just pure cash, we would have spent it on marketing to get those two things and there would be no guarantees on that actually working. Um, so that was gave us a huge kick back in 2013 when that came on board. Um, we also acquired a business called Adage, a mature age jobs board. Um, the reason for doing that was because we had a lot of customers who were using our, I suppose, 18 to 34 year olds, but then we're also looking for the mature age strategies. Um, as we have an aging population, this is something that we need to be really aware of. Um, and so for that, we purchased the marketplace, added it to our own, and now have been able to work with companies like ANZ with their mature age workforce strategies and things like that for the future. Um, so always looking outside the square and looking at quick hacks, I guess, to try and accommodate for your user base and get it done quicker is always a good thing to look at as well. So we've also got a lot of media coverage, which has been fantastic to get awareness. A lot of people still don't know about us. I mean, how many people here knew about one shift before this? I've got one hand at least, please, thank you. <laughs> um, it's an ongoing battle. You know, we're three years old and not a lot of people know about us. Um, but we've got over 500 000, or half a million users out of about 620,000 profiles and about 36,000 businesses. So trying to get that, that uh, flag waving going is really important for us over the next sort of six to 12 months so that when I'm at talks like this, I go, who knows of one shift and everyone raises their hand, that's the dream. Um, so we're constantly working with media to try and get out there so that it's direct and specific to who we need to be talking to. And editorial works a hell of a lot better than um, advertising. So working with journalists is really important and working with them to figure out what stories that they need to be getting across so that you can try and somehow get your story in there gives you a lot of credibility as well. So our challenges to date, lots of them is the understatement of the year, but um, growth and data and analytics is really important. So growth for us around people, getting those right people in the business from day one, really important. 
when you hire those game changers, they make a huge impact on your business and you remember them as that. And you can see it in your growth timeline as well. You know, we know when our CTO started, because when he, through his interview, I literally told him the wrong database, we were using the wrong language, you know, all sorts. You name it, I probably told him the wrong thing. When he started, was like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> um, and also our CMO. So marketing and dev are really important to our business. And you have to figure out for yourselves what is important in your business and how key those hires are. Making sure people are in line with your values and the vision and they are, bought, they are really bought into where you guys are heading is also really important. So making sure that no matter what, everyone's heading in the same direction and knows where you're heading and that communication is really important as well. So our structure is a big one at the moment because we've got about 40 to 50 staff trying to keep that startup nimbleness, so to speak, but while also with so many people keeping structure is a an interesting battle because you don't want to turn into a corporate that can't get anything done in 24 hours because that'd be silly. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're not hurting stray cats every single day because that's painful. Um, data and algorithms is an interesting one because we collect so much information on our users, businesses and candidates, their interactions and things like that. It's better to ask more and then figure out what to do with it later. Um, so we're constantly tweaking that to make sure both businesses and candidates get the best possible experience um, while also making sure that we're not overloading them with information. Go, okay, there are three people like you applying for this job right now and you're going, oh my God, apply 20,000 times. That's not best for anyone. <laughs> Um, so we're constantly tweaking that, working with the algorithm to see how we can be uh, serve the best possible um, user experience over and over again, and the site's never done. Um, my dad is come, has come from property and construction, um, so the analogy I always give is when you build a house, it's finished, you put the front door on the windows, yada yada, but for a website, it's never finished. You're constantly tweaking, adapting, and you'll find that small changes based on analytics on how people are acting on the site can have a huge impact on, on your website and conversions and things like that. So really making sure that you have your Google Analytics set up from day one and you can track everything and then make decisions from there. More information is key. So we have real people, that's our whole focus about making sure it's not just profiles and email addresses, it's actually real people in the marketplace. So we do have, so for example, um, our eldest is 86, she has a certificate three and four in aged care, she's 86 going on 46 and I will never understand that, but um, she work, works at retirement home, so it's like, oh yeah, how's your grandmother, oh sorry, how are your grandkids, fantastic, how are you, mine, fantastic, have your meds, I'll have mine, all works. But an instance like that would never work through a jobs board or, you know, gum tree or whatever the case, it's about connecting real people to real situations. Um, so we're constantly working on that, how we can bring those stories to life so you can meet Bob, who's we actually had a policeman who um, was saving up, trying to bring on another, or take on another role so he could get his dream wedding for his fiance. So you hear really cool stories like that that need to be showcased to show how real the people are within the marketplace. So with that data, we literally collect everything from whether they smoke, to hair color, to education level, you name it. Because the more information we get, the more we know about people, the better experience that we can give them. But I'm sure you can appreciate it being in recruitment People are like, well, why do you want to know that smoke? It's like, well, hang on. We actually, we've never had a business use it for the wrong reason. So we watch what everyone's doing, stalk a big brother star. And the only instances we actually find people use it is for like a um, coffee shop in Melbourne, for example. They want a bearded, tattooed um, coffee artist who smokes and just fits in with that look and feel hipster star. Whereas you don't get it where they go, we don't want a smoke or we don't want a, a male, I don't know, to be a ballerina, whatever the case. Um, so it's always interesting to watch how people interact with that information and it's going to be ever evolving But of course, it's all in the delivery from us Why we need this is because you can apply for this hipster cafe role because you have a beard. Congratulations <laughs> How long did it take to grow that? Um, like a week and a bit. So. That's pretty good <laughs> effort, I'm just saying, right? <laughs> uh, so with all the data we collect, uh, we will use it for communities Like for example, we'll show everyone who works at McDonald's in the country um, we'll also show the ratings that candidates give. It means that as a business, you can not only find people that match your role, but find someone who's already been pre-trained in that area. So you're not wasting time and money on bringing somebody into your business. So it's trying to create efficiencies on both sides of the marketplace with the data that we collect. So where we're headed, it's a creepy graph picture. So it's an algorithm-based business. So the more stuff that comes in on both sides means the algorithm actually learns every single time. So like a job board where you post a role, your next role actually devalues yours in that feed or you can pay a fun fee and stay at the top, that's bloody expensive for what it is. 
with us, the more roles you actually put in and the more interactions you have, the algorithm actually learns from every instance. So how a candidate reacts to when they look at a role or how a business reacts when they look at a candidate profile, it's constantly fine tuning. So that's why we keep our prices so low, 30 bucks, it's cheap as chips. Um, and then the more we get in from all sides, means that we get the most traction or better results for everyone. Um, so we have about 1,500 to 1,800 candidates a day signing up. Um, and from there, we, I guess, are constantly growing. So um, currently in Australia, uh, we're about 10.8% of the Australian part-time market um, and 4.2% at any one time. Um, each month, there's about 600,000 people a month looking for part-time work. Um, so we'll capture about, the, about 25 to 30,000 of that every month. So it's constantly growing, but we are always pushing people out as if they're not active, they're not actually in the best interest of the marketplace. So at about 620,000 profiles, we're about 500, 505,000 um, active in the marketplace. But of course, that's so dynamic, depending on what's going on. Um, for example, hospitality in October, we actually get 15% of all roles posted in that month, the lead up to Christmas, summer, silly season, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's really dynamic and it depends on what's going on. And that will be it with one shift. Does anyone have any questions? Because nobody asked one during that whole thing. Yes. Um, how do you deal with anti-discriminatory sort of issues? Yeah. So you said that maybe a business was looking for someone with a beard or tattoos. Yep. Has anyone ever complained about those sort of requirements considering it's based on appearance? So we have a public company invested in us. So you can imagine we uh, have to be quite protected of, of how we approach these things. So to speak, so we're dealing with lawyers like at least once a month, just mm -hmm. sense check to make sure we aren't doing the wrong thing. Um, but then there's also that ethical approach as well. So we'll make sure that it's not being used in, the, in an appropriate way. So if somebody's coming on and just to put up the worst example possible, they go, I want a female who, I don't know, doesn't have a tattoo, or has a tattoo and has blonde hair and I don't know, walks around in stilettos, as an example. Um, then you'll go, well, hang on, that's for the wrong reasons. But fortunately enough, we've never actually had that. It's always been um, a tattoo parlor looking for a tattooist and they want somebody who has tattoos to show off their tattoos. Fair enough, that can go through. If people do use it, there is actually somebody who's live checking any roles and any backlog of roles that have come through using particular instances, we will double check it. But again, stuff slips through at 3 a.m. 3 in the morning when I'm awake. <laughs> but touch wood, we've been fortunate enough that nothing has slipped through today. But I think it's creating the culture within the marketplace. You know, it's the type of businesses using it. We have turned away businesses from using the site to make sure that they're not, you know, just because they're not in line with our values and what we're trying to create. Um, as well as candidates. If candidates are coming on and doing dodgy stuff, then thank you very much, but we're blocking your ID. So it's got to work both ways, businesses and candidates. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah? What are some of the most interesting trends in that, all the data that you've got? Just yep. about um, we've had some weird ones. Like, for example, we had a bunch of dental nurses signing up. And you go, have you seen our logo? Why are you signing up for this? Um, so you really just have to cater for whatever's coming on. And I think that's changed uh, change the nature of the marketplace as well. So when we first started, one-off shifts hospitality, so it was more just 20 to 25 year olds working as a bartender. Um, and, but as we had more and more people signing up, we then adapted what the marketplace was used for um, because of the uses that we had, the skill sets that they had, and also what industries they wanted to be in. Um, we found weird things like a 36 year old male who lived in, or who was in Sydney CBD and had brown hair, had a 40% more likely chance of owning a vehicle than a blonde 36 year old male in the Sydney CBD. And it's the complete opposite in Melbourne CBD. The blonde has a more likely chance of owning a vehicle than a good 36 year old male. So you see weird stuff like that, but it's all, then what do you do with that? I don't know. It's not helping anyone get a job. <laughs> Question. Yes, bearded man. Um, <laughs> um, so the finders fee that they pay yep. like $30. Um, is that just a one-off thing, or do you guys take like a commission off there? Yeah. Yeah, it's 30 bucks, it's more like a search, per search, yeah. but you can imagine people don't get so that. So if they get like a part-time job after that, do you guys don't? They get a full-time job, we don't yeah. care. Think dating website, it's Tinder, yeah. we introduce you, whatever happens happens. You so get married. Is that like a good. referral system where they, like, the company, the company they got the job with, like, sort of gives you feedback as to how they did, or? We, do, we used to do ratings yeah. for the candidates, but what we actually found was businesses wouldn't tell us if you were good, because they want to keep you for themselves but then they would be very colorful in their language when they wanted to tell us okay. you were bad because they wanted to you know, get back at you in some way. Yeah. So what we decided to do was turn that off from a business candidate point of view um, because it wasn't adding any value for the candidate right. and the candidate's not the we, No, we've kept that one the other way because it's even if you haven't worked for that business through one shift, we want to know feedback on those companies because yeah. it's kind of a selling tool as well. Because if I can go to, for example, um, 
David Jones, that's here, um, and you say, hey, David Jones, there's 50,000 people that have worked for you, here's all the ratings and feedback, and I've currently got, you know, 500 staff that are working for you right now using this platform as well. They've got a huge incentive to be a part of it and actually maintain their profile and all those sorts of things. But with respect to, so maybe they work for the company if they didn't like it, oh, does yeah. the company get negatively Yeah, they can have good and bad. Yeah, it has it So all. they drop down the list or something? Is there like a repercussion of being a bad? So if we get it, if we get bad feedback, we actually interrogate it and okay. find out what happens. So if it's you know I didn't get paid or whatever, we'll actually have to go through and say right here are the appropriate bodies for you to speak to. However, of course, we're not the police and we can't do anything more than that. But we can We've actually blocked people before for not being appropriate with candidates because oh. candidates first. Yeah. Cool. How did you get any coverage when you were starting up? Uh, harass, stalk. Annoying. It's probably the, the slogan. <laughs> um, it's hard because when you are a startup, um, unfortunately, your first instinct is to go to, "Hey, we're doing this amazing business," and that and reporting isn't necessarily about an ad, right? It's about an engaging story that somebody wants to read. So trying to step back and think about what's an interesting story that a journalist will actually want to put in the paper rather than advertisement about your business. That's probably the hardest part, getting that right. Um, a lot of <coughs> PR companies will actually work with startups to help them get those first stories, just as a bit of pro bono, um, or even speaking to journalists. A lot of journalists want to help get more startups into the press. So just trying to reach out on Twitter or things like that and try and engage with them and try and get feedback, um, a lot of them are open to that. So once you get that story and that relationship <coughs> right, um, so for example, I know now if we put something on social media about staff and we're increasing teams and things like that, shortlist call us within five minutes and shortlist is a recruitment um, publication. They're like, hey, Jen, what's going out? Come speak to you in a couple of weeks, what's going on? Because they want to know those things. So if you can establish those relationships, it's really important. Um, but again, that takes time and obviously as you get bigger, they care more about you. But until you get bigger, they're just like, but that's just the way things are. So annoy, harass and stalk. <laughs> So I noticed um, that you guys are doing kind of a video resume. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts kind of on changing the traditional paper resume? Um, any kind of yeah. interesting insights on that? Yeah, definitely. I think three years ago, it was hard to get people to put photos on their resume. Whereas now, it's the same. Like it was even hard, you couldn't get a video. Whereas now, everyone's more comfortable putting a photo, but now it's still that same negotiation to get that video. I think from a... Um, I mean, there's interesting technologies coming out where you record your video, it takes whatever words you um, say and puts that into text, so it's searchable then. You can't, you know, you've got to have that text to make it searchable. But how much can you actually say in a video? So having that work history, you're not going to read out your whole work history to get that in. So you still need that text to make it searchable with some description. Just trying to find that data is probably the toughest point. Um, I think for us, I don't think it's going to be the immediate uptake that you get now. A lot of businesses are moving towards that, so a lot of retail businesses, if people don't do video introductions, they actually won't even look at you. Um, so I think it's moving in that direction the same way as photos have, um, but it's going to take I think another 12 months to get that sort of uptake, if that makes sense. So is there any kind of idea of having kind of an ongoing resume? So I suppose you know, if someone has a lot of success finding a job with yep. one shift, they'll find another job with one shift yep. and so on, then you kind of can potentially create, I'd imagine, a, a response where people will just update their resume on one shift as yep. they go. Is that kind of the goal with it? Oh, we've already got that happening at the moment, but it's more trying to figure out, I think, the bigger challenge is, it's not like Facebook where you wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to check my Facebook feed. It's a job, let's be serious, it's not that exciting. But how do you create that engagement where they do keep doing that? Um, LinkedIn has the purpose, other than job searching, it's also about networking, it's your business card, essentially, and also if you want to get into another company onto someone, there's <coughs> that other purpose, so we need to figure out what that other purpose is to get that higher engagement rate for those sorts of things. But yeah, good question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the five million and the twenty-seven percent. Yep. How did you arrive at that figure? Whether it's the twenty-seven percent or the five million. Yeah. No, it was literally. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> there was no maths behind it. Was literally um, what is a meaningful percentage of yeah. the program? Because they were bringing. How do you value the in kind? How do you value the candidates and businesses and support really needed, as well as shared services like lawyers get access to all their sales staff. So if a sales um, member goes through and goes, okay, I'm going to sell. Um, programs, okay, that's not going to work. Oh, also, we have one shift you want, if you want to do it yourself anyway, because obviously, if it either goes to us or them, yeah. the company's winning at some point. Um, so, we just literally got to that point. It's a meaningful stake at 27.5%. How much money? Great. But again, it's they're in it for the long run. It wasn't a here's at $100 million and see you later, we'll return it next month. It was yeah. a right, this is a meaningful relationship. How do we grow this thing? Yeah. Cool. In the back, Evan. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, how much funding did one shift? 
result in a lot of bodies yep. to um, get it to the point where you took on the investment? How much revenue are you going to try to take on investment as well? Private investment, gosh, that's a good question. How do you remove that? Um, what do you think about that? So, leading up to it, um, sorry, I think it's a lady who needs to come in and back to it. Yep. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Gosh, the first website, I think we spent um, only a couple of thousand on after doing the blog, and then from there, it kind of ramped up, you know, every new feature, so it was a couple of thousand dollars, a couple of thousand dollars, so it built up quite quickly. Um, like before, when the program first approached us, we actually weren't charging at all. We were a blog, essentially, for all intents and purposes, so and they wanted to be involved then, but we were like, we need to get some sort of traction of what this business model is and actually be able to take credit cards before taking on investment, because it would be too early. There's no point trying to throw money at something that's not ready for scale. Um, so when they did come on, it was really early days. I'd be saying like ten thousand dollars at max um, per month. But from I mean the last financial year alone, we grew six hundred and forty-five percent. Um, so it really takes a bit of time, I think, for online businesses to get that revenue traction. I mean we changed our payment model maybe eight times, um, and I think you just got to keep changing it from feedback that you get from your users so that you can keep um, getting the best traction possible. Good question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, what's it like being an Australian local startup and how do you consider the international market? I think there's no place in the world like Australia to start a startup up because it is the, a testing ground that people actually have money to spend. Um, and uh, I think you can, even though it is spread out, it's a secluded market that you can really see what's working, what's not. So if you can get it working here, you've got a better chance of getting it working overseas. Um, internationally, I think there's a, you know, the American dream of going over there and putting your startup in San Fran, right? But the moment your developers touch their toes on the ground over there, they go on to Facebook, Google, and other startups that have a hell of a lot more money. Um, for every $5 that was invested in a startup last year in Australia, there was $100 invested in an American startup. So there's a, a lot more money going around over there. But I think for us, it's about making sure that we get it right here so that we're not going overseas and dropping the ball and then losing what we've done in three years here. So we want to make sure that we can have a scalable model that we can just turn on without actually having to relocate everyone and all that sort of stuff, the cost involved and whatnot. So if we can do that, I think that's where we're going to be successful, but we're looking at all sorts of markets, whether it's anywhere in Asia, US, UK, whatever the case, it's about starting small, getting traction, and then scaling from there outside of Australia. So um, how do you find that uh, people, I guess, engage because you're quite young, but you've already done a lot. So do you find that there's any challenges or is it an advantage? How does it work? Uh, I think age is only an issue if you make it an issue. If you walk into a boardroom and roll around on the floor like an idiot, then they'll treat you like that. <laughs> um, I haven't really, the only instances I've ever had it as an issue is um, with suppliers, because they straight away go, oh, you're the receptionist, and you go, that's fine, um, and then treat them accordingly and tell them you're not working for them because they're not in line with what you want to achieve. Um, but other than that, never really had an issue. Friends are still my friends. <laughs> yeah. How old is everyone? What's the youngest age in this room? I'm not going to take a guess. 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds, we got 19, 20, yeah. 18? Good we are. Good on you. <laughs> what about oldest? Have we got any 25 year olds? 30 year olds? I've got the oldest, man. Go on. Do you want me to keep going up? <laughs> no. <laughs> Look, I think, I don't think age, it's at the end of the day, no one's going to hand you anything on a silver platter, right? It's all about the effort that you actually put in. Um, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning to put up posters with duct tape versus somebody who's asleep. Um, you're, there's a, put it this way, there's a thousand other people thinking about the same idea you are around the world. Um, it all comes down to the people who actually do it. You're not going to get it right the first 10 million times, I can tell you that, but when you do it, it gets easier and easier as you learn what works and what doesn't, you're constantly evolving. Um, so just giving it a crack is probably the best piece of advice I can give you it's just having that first conversation go to startup events come hang out at bloom lab you know things like that come check out the sydney startup scene there's so much going on over there the highest um population of startups or density of startups is at fish burners in sydney so if anyone wants to go there hook you up with them um, at fish burners uh just meeting other startups and figuring out what they're doing what's working what's not can really give you that edge um to a competing in the startup space how many deep firing questions <laughs> <laughs> So, um, is there anything that you did in the early stages that if you were to do it again, you know, benefit of hindsight to look back and say, you know, this probably would have been the thing that we wouldn't have done, we would have done this instead? Um, to be honest, I wouldn't change anything. I think at the end of the day, you make a lot of stuff ups, but it's what you learn from that that actually gets you to where you are, right? So for us, um, 
I wouldn't change anything to because that's where we are today is because of all that. So I think just try lots of things, small things, see if it works, if it's not, pull it and just move on and keep trying different things. Yep. So I suppose at the beginning, um, you had no users, you had no businesses <laughs> yeah. on board. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> Even the end problem, right? How did you go about, I suppose, yeah, other than really just pounding the pavement, what kind of strategy did you use to manage supply and demand and build the marketplace yeah. accordingly? The strategy was not used until I think about year two. Okay. <laughs> um, it was very much a shotgun approach. Uh, but I think it's just really, it's funny, It's as you're getting started, it's all about just waving that flag and faking it till you make it. And when you go see a business, yeah, we've got 10 million users. What are you talking about? Of course, like, come join. It's going to be amazing. It's selling that dream. Um, and I think it's important that you, like for us, candidates and business is the hardest thing in the world because you've got to, no matter how many candidates you have, you've got to have a hell of a lot more jobs, right? To kind of keep everybody happy and vice versa. So for us, when we first started, it was businesses. Businesses are our focus because they give us the money. So why aren't we focusing on businesses? And then we realized, well, hang on, what are we actually selling here? It's getting candidates and jobs. That's why we started. And so that's why we changed everything to be put the candidate first. What do they want? How are we going to make it a great experience for them? And that's when we've had our success is because we figured out what our true vision is, what we were trying to achieve, and we kept everything coming back to <coughs> Oh, you want to add that feature in? Great. Why is that putting candidate first? Why is changing the whole site to pink putting the candidate first? You'd be surprised what we get asked. <laughs> no, you've got to figure out what's core to your business, though. Okay. Don't change your website to pink. <laughs> Um, so you download the app and then you get a job. How do you maintain sort of the use of your app and your website once someone has gotten a job? Yeah, so it's an interesting challenge we have because, I mean, think about how exciting looking at a job is every day if you've already got one. Um, for us, it's about making sure there is high turnover jobs. So if you, jobs, so if you get um, lots of freelance work, for example, for us, at least you'll keep coming back. If you have a great experience, you'll keep coming back. Um, the average turnaround time in hospitality is actually six weeks. Um, uni holidays, you've got everything from uh, family, um, just sick of the job, whatever the case, you just want to change your shift. So I think because fortunately or unfortunately our generation likes change, likes things instantly, people are more comfortable with changing roles more aggressively, which works for us. But again, we need to figure out what that other thing is to keep people engaged besides money and job or jobs. You again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I suppose you've got companies like Woolies, for example, you've got tons of kids just going and putting resumes yeah. down on the desk. They you know, got a whole heap of kids yeah. to hire. How do you go about competing with that model there when they're already getting that for free? How do you yeah. go about monetizing that? Yeah, of course. So that's an interesting challenge, I think, for businesses today. So you think about Seek is used as a billboard essentially to drive eyeballs on jobs, but it's not necessarily who you want to work for you, it's the people who want a job. Um, then you have companies like Woolworths who will spend millions of dollars on a TV ad saying, hey, work for Woolworths, you know the one with the, I'm pretty sure it would have been shown here as well, the mum and the, the kid going first day of work, straight up tie kind of thing, yeah. Um, but that's then going for the, uh, the brand, the commercial brand of Woolworths that people like. So if you do it as Uber, everyone's like, wow, it's Uber, that's amazing, I want to work there but that's people who like the idea of the company. So then trying to say, well, that's people who want a job, people who like your company and want to work for that company, but not necessarily the right fit for your company and the skill sets you need, that's where we come in. We can connect you with exactly what you want when you need it versus, I guess, the free-for-all that's going to cost you time and money to do anyway, and it's instant. You search blue cars, you get blue cars with this, retail assistants, store managers in that postcode ready to go. It's a better offering. So it has more value for kind of more skilled like managers and things rather than your know, high school kids or something. Yeah, like that. but we have that as well if they want that and it's just a more process way. So we actually have clients who will actually have us um, a part of their strategy. When people come in, they go, great, here's one shift, sign up, you'll access our stuff there, they'll be fine, you'll be fine, you because they just don't want to deal with all that anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that's slowly changing for employers, but I think they're still trying to figure out how they transition from Seek and they're realizing that Seek isn't the be all and end all anymore because you know, candidates are a lot more internet savvy first day and they're trying to figure out social media skill and all that sort of stuff that businesses need to catch up with. Sorry, Evan, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about analytics and yeah. using data and uh, different testing strategies. At what kind of point in the journey does that start happening? So obviously the first couple of years you're saying you're training water and then you're yeah. bringing people on, so it's just out of interest. When, yeah. as you say, that's like really taking effect and you start seeing results from, from, from an analytical point of view? Yeah. 
Um, I think that's really evolved as well as myself learning. Because, um, you know, when you, when you can say, oh, I know that that person logged in four times this week and did this, this, this. I thought that was pretty cool. But then as you're learning more and more of what you can actually ask for, I think that's as, how the site evolved. But I think if you got someone in from day one who actually knew what the hell you could ask for and look at, I think you'd have a much different, uh, better approach at it, probably a more um, considered approach <laughs> rather than a shotgun. Like, hey, we can do this. Oh, let's try this. Um, you just kind of end up with that bolt on. Um, sort of situation and we did have that we rebuilt the website in 2013 because we had that because it was like oh and this shiny light and this shiny light and let's add that um, so being able to strip that all back really know what we need to achieve and then rebuild it to suit meant that we had a much cleaner approach so I think 2013 so after about a year and a bit of um, being in action we, we kind of figured out what we needed and what we wanted to look at what's your business what are you looking at analytics no, I'm <laughs> energy, energy. Yeah, oh, awesome. energy, yeah. yeah, so just about everything you could possibly even think you'd think you'd need, ask up yeah, I'm just yeah. sending out loads of surveys and trying to actually speak to yeah. customers see what they really want instead Great of what idea. I think they want. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. That's a much better way of doing it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's going to evolve as people get on there as well, because funnily enough, some people don't even know what they want, so which can skew, I guess, the feedback that you yeah, actually get. Yeah, like trying to work around not actually asking direct questions, but yeah. indirect questions, which something yeah anyway yeah. I'll have a discussion Good idea. <laughs> fair enough back to Evan right yeah. um, so what sort of advice do you give to um, people who are starting up in relation to investing um, try and figure out what is what is success if you were given think bring it back to that hundred million dollars if somebody gave you a big fat check what would you actually spend it on to actually make your business successful because if you can figure that out and find that person to invest in your company you guarantee you're saving time and money essentially to kind of get to where you need to be um, so for us, as those candidates and businesses, we really need to figure out what that is because otherwise you'll get VCs that will want to get your business up front for very little money, you get a small valuation, and then you're going to be asked to kind of pr provide results pretty damn quickly. Um, VCs in the States, for example, will literally invest quite aggressively in about 25 startups. If five of them pull off, they know they've made a great investment. Um, so they're not too worried about the other 20 and aren't going to invest their time and skill sets into making this thing work. So think of it as marriage. Um, we send flowers every year. So it's, it's about making sure that you have a great relationship for the good times and the bad times so that you can figure out the problems um, and find those solutions to make sure that you can keep going and keep getting through. Um, as silly as it sounds, we, we went on many a dates just to make sure that we could actually gel well together and knew that we could actually get through you know, the hard times because everything's good when it's good, but when it all hits the fan, you've got to make sure that you can work together, so yeah. Do you think there's the right time for that as well? You know, is there kind of like, can be too early, too late? Is there when do you think it's right for a startup to start considering investment? investment? I think it's hard because the further you are along the line, you should be able to value it higher because you've actually proven the model more and more. Um, for us, in hindsight, I think it was good that we waited an extra six months just because trying to value something that's a blog, like it's pretty hard, um, but trying to value something where we actually knew what the financial transaction was that you could then model that out and say, right, this is what we should be making in six, 12 months time. Um, and then within this investment, this will have this impact. Um, gives you something a little bit more tangible to be, I guess, betting on essentially for your investors. Because at the end of the day, you can trick them into giving you money, but then you have to go prove or go do what you, you sold them. So that's probably the hardest part. So make sure you're not overselling yourself. Make sure that you're not, you know, saying you're going to be Facebook next week for a startup that's a couple months old. And prove the model, being confident in what you're doing, um, and set the expectations on both sides. So be really clear that you are a startup, and you know things will change every day. Um, trying to promise that you're going to do exactly a 10 step program, it's going to be really hard to deliver on because you don't know what's around the corner. <laughs> Not Evan, <laughs> you sir. <laughs> just because you're talking it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just a quick question, who do you follow? So from a social media point of view, yeah. a mentor or something like that, mm -hmm. who's someone that you follow? That's a good question. Um, that was going to be my question as well. Actually. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, the next one, I'm ready. <laughs> Um, look, I think it's actually going to all the startup promotion spaces. It's rather than, I guess, the big sort of, it's not like I go follow Mark Zuckerberg on Twitter and go, he's who I want to be. It's talking at other startup co-working spaces and seeing what other people are doing. Because I think you can learn a lot of cool tricks and hacks <coughs> doing that versus, I guess, the bigger picture. Um, being able to reach out to larger corporates, they're actually really receptive when you need help. Like, I'll, I will link in pretty much anyone I need help in, in whatever area, whether it's marketing or um, sales. Uh, for example, um, Aussie Home Loans, I went and spoke to their head of marketing, the CMO, back in 2013, um, just to get some advice on our media plan and what we think we're doing. And he was like, yep, sweet, come in, give you half hour, 
went through the plan and went, they're charging you too much here, 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 go back and change it like this, give them that, and they'll, they'll then know that you know what you're doing and they won't try and rip you off. It was fantastic, you walked in, here you go. And they're like, oh, okay, you actually know what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, sure. Cool, but it's, you know, you don't know unless you're asking people. So don't necessarily have one locked in mentor, pull people in as you need them. Um, and people are actually really receptive to helping startups out. So as long as you're um, respective of their time, respective of their time, yeah. Cool. Has anyone got any cool mentors? Any cool kids that you guys follow? No one has a mentor? One? Who yeah. do you follow? Um, not one person oh, specifically, yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of people in the WA places that know. Yeah. Just, you can contact them and say, hey, can I have a coffee? And yeah. It's one of the only places in the world where people say, yeah, sure. That's great. And they will, yeah. and you can get some real gems of wisdom, yeah, just yeah. from chatting to people. Yeah. And, yeah, form relationships. I haven't been here very long, but yeah, I've been really lucky to form some actual relationships with yeah. people that are, yeah, and I'm drawing on their wisdom, so that's great. That's fantastic. Have you had some, I guess, have they completely changed your decision or focus or path that you're heading down? Yeah, so I'm, I'm an engineer and I always yeah. just think, can, can it be made? Yeah. Can it be made from a technology point of view? And the question now is more, should it be made? So I've yeah. flipped everything on my whole thinking on its head, really, to so, say, yeah, that would be probably... You're great at handstands, Sam. I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I can walk on my own. Any last questions? Questioned out? Cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a lot. If anyone else has a question, they don't want to. Yeah. So I'm um, gonna ask you two. So, uh, Can somebody jump on really, this band, please? In terms of your early, um, your founding sort of um, team yeah. and so forth, and that sort of thing, do you have advice for you know, what a team should look like in the early stages? Do you think go it alone, find someone who has what sort of school skill sets do you think should be? Yeah. Really I think day one, it's do it yourself because you can't give other people direction unless you've done it yourself and actually figured out what you actually need. Um, don't hire on skill sets from day one, just get hands on deck. Um, so for example, the first person I hired, she, her name was Jade, she was a backpacker from Ireland and it was just basically having, I filled up my whole day, couldn't do anything more, I handed that over to her and said, right, here's your day. And I went, went out and looked for new opportunities on how to grow this thing. Um, I think it's really difficult to hire on skill sets from day one if you don't even know what this thing is going to look like, what you need to scale it, what works and what doesn't. So a lot of trial and error. Awesome. And um, so, you know, obviously it's not going to be able with uh, really great initiative and energy and so forth. So what sort of advice do you give to people who are just starting out um, yep. or you know, already kind of at it? Early stage? What's your what's your piece of advice? Um, you're going to get pushed back on a lot. You're going to get a lot of no's, but don't be disheartened by that. I think that's probably the first point that people start tapping out. Um, if you're determined and passionate enough to kind of push, keep pushing through, I think that's where you're going to get the success. Um, and don't be afraid to be honest. Like if you're having a tough day, just go talk to somebody, get it off your chest and then keep moving. And um, Because the biggest problem I think people have is they expect if they push one button, you know, you're going to be successful overnight. And unfortunately, when they tell the stories of success overnight, there's probably been about three to five years of absolute heartache <laughs> um, before getting to that point. So really trying to understand that there is a process that you need to go through to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, just don't get disheartened, just keep pushing through. Are you done, Evan? I'm done. <laughs> Steph? Oh, Emma? Cool. Yep. Cool. Great, thank you very much. challenge um, where you can get in a group of three people to solve a sort of unique business problem. Sign-ups are free um, and all of the prizes for this year haven't been announced. Last year the winners all got iPad minis so it's free to sign up so um, it's definitely worth your time. Um, if any of you are new to the Flume Mode, if you've never been here before, um, feel free to ask myself or any of our other members um, some questions if you want to find out anything more. So again, thank you Jen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much. It's great to meet you. Good luck with everything.